Um, we're going to shift gears completely. We're not going to talk about dangerous C-spine injuries. We're going to talk about sundry problems that can go wrong with hands. So this is uh, wrist, hand, finger potpourri, part one. And um, I'll, I'll catch us up on time because I get to do wrist, hand, finger potpourri after the panel discussion, and I can catch up uh, and get us back on time. So anyway, um, Hands, fingers, wrists, etc. These are a problematic area for us for lots of reasons. They're very commonly injured, obviously. You probably see one, one or two or five or ten of these, depending on whether you work in a fast track shift or not. Every single shift. Um, and most of them are relatively straightforward. However, there are a whole host of things that can go south. And when they go south, they go south badly, right? These have some cosmetic problems, but really mismanagement of fractures, tendon injuries, et cetera, can lead to functional uh, impairment that can persist for quite a long time. So, you know, obviously this is something that we have to be concerned about. Um, and this set of this series of two lectures will help us get out of most of the trouble um, in most of the circumstances. I'm going to start uh, with abstract uh, number two, actually, and then go to number one, just because I, I want to contextualize it. You know. So fractures are the most common, co the most common, the most frequent, I should say, um, payout or cause of a, misfractures are the most common payout reason for a malpractice, right? It's not the biggest dollar amount, that's, you know, the missed MIs and the TPA for stroke and the, the missed meningitis for kids, et cetera, but they're commonly missed. How big is that problem? Abstract 2 sort of gets at that a little bit at least. Um, it says most frequently missed fractures in the ED. This is a study out of... Um, out of Children's Hospital in, in uh, Virginia. And so this is a PEDS study. And it's a study of their discrepancy file. So the emergency physician doctor notes you know, what they saw on the x-ray. And then when the radiologist overreads it several days later, I, no, I, don't, I don't know that that's true. That, that's at our house in, in, at LA County USC. It's like weeks later they come back. <laughs> like the patient's like, my hand, yeah, my fracture is healed. Um, anyway, so they had an overread and uh, they, they found a fracture. And they're just characterizing what the fracture fractures are that emergency physicians frequently missed. They had 220 fractures over a 40-month period. Unfortunately, we don't know anything about the denominator. We have no idea if that represents, you know, sort of less than 1% or 4%, 5%. We just don't know um, what the denominator is. But they go on to nonetheless characterize these. And because it's in the wrist hand potpourri section, you can imagine what the results are going to show. Over a quarter of the missed fractures involved the hand. The large majority of those um, were fa phalanx fractures. Now, we don't know if these were important fractures and if the little kid's fingers are going to fall off and st all those things, although we suspect they probably won't. Um, but nonetheless, it may lead to increased pain for the child, inappropriate non-splinting, and then, of course, the dreaded, they see their pediatrician get another, you know, get an x-ray or the pediatrician reads the x-ray a week later, um, and then you get the nasty gram from your chair saying how, you know, you missed poor little Johnny's fracture and all hell is going to break loose. So be aware that f finger fractures are commonly missed. The other commonly missed fractures, most of them were of the upper extremity, not surprisingly, I mean, kids fall and they hurt their arms and hands and such, um, were elbow injuries. And the reason for missed fractures there was, the was most commonly cited as the failure to recognize a posterior fat pad. Um, I think we probably all know that it's frequently difficult to see the actual fracture line in a child or an adult, really, with elbow pain. Um, in a child, it'll depending on the age, but in this particular series, it was most commonly a supracondylar fracture that was missed, but often the only radiographic sign was a, a, a posterior fat pad. If you're not familiar with looking at those, go look it up in a book. It's a, you know, a dark stripe that um, is in the posterior, behind the olecranon, and it's always abnormal. So anyway, that was what they noted. They also noted some distal radius fractures, et cetera, that were missed. But that's the sort of just to lay out the landscape that hand, um, wrist injuries and then elbow injuries are the most commonly missed fractures um, that we as emergency physicians missed. The abstract number one, one of my personal favorites, a long series of abstracts bashing emergency physicians. This is one of them. Uh, it's called Why All Finger Fractures Should Be Referred to a Hand Surgery Service, a Prospective Study of Primary Management. It's, in, uh, it's an old study, 1990, it's British. And you know, it's, it is truly a classic ER bashing uh, study. They went in and looked at all of the, the hand fractures that were diagnosed in a given emergency, in a emergency department in Britain. Uh, there were a whole bunch of them. 
them, 624, I think it was a one-year period, uh, and then they wrote a very strongly worded letter, which is essentially what this, uh, this article is. What they found in implicit chart review, so this is the hand surgeons going back and saying, oh yeah, let's look at all these things. What they found was that mismanagement of fractures, according to them, was very common, 27% of the time. Now, a full third of that, a full third of that mismanagement was because there was no fracture. Okay, so they, the radiologists got us on that one, right? So they, they, they said that there was a fracture, there wasn't a fracture, and so the, the hand surgeon said, you know, you, the emergency department mismanaged it because they put the kid in a splint or the, the adult in a, in, a, in a thumb spiker or something like that, and there just simply wasn't a fracture. So uh, that was a major problem. The other issues that we did commonly were put the wrong type of splint on. Again, this is an implicit chart review. This is a hand surgeon saying, I wouldn't have done that. You know, so we really have no idea whether they were right or we were right or who was whoever, whomever was right. But we do know that in, from in retrospect and from the judgment chair, a lot of people will critique our management of fractures and hand fractures in particular. So we should be aware of that so that we can try to do the old preemptive strike that was discussed yesterday. Say, oh yeah, you know, if the hand surgeon says, you know, you need a splint, boy, he hasn't read literature in 35 years, so, et cetera. Um, there's a couple other things that we, we were commonly criticized for. One was that we didn't give antibiotics for open distal finger fractures. That's another area where that's just the right thing to do, is to not give antibiotics. We'll talk about that in the second, second section and the literature behind that. But so again, we get, we'll get criticized no matter what. Um, just be aware. And then finally, just a small percent of these, ki these people needed surgery, but we don't know if those were the ones that were mismanaged or not. So that's sort of the, the landscape. They're frequently missed. Uh, we're going to be frequently criticized when we try to manage them. You know, it's the life of the emergency physician. All right, so the next question abstracts three and four deal with are, all right, let's, let's say let's give that we're going to miss some of these fractures. Is there anything we can do to increase our ability to detect them? Okay, particularly when suspicion or clinical suspicion is relatively high. The first article is, are oblique views needed for trauma radi radiography of the finger? So the standard at our institution is a three-view finger x-ray. I don't know if that's the standard at your institution or if you do two views or 12 views or whatever, but most places, I think, do a three-view. And this is sort of one of the articles. There are a few of them in the literature, only one in this chapter, but there's a few of them that suggest that you do gain some value from the oblique view. Um, so it's 421 21 people with fractures, uh, another 1,000 people. That, so it's a consecutive sample of uh, 1,400, 1,500 people uh, who are being evaluated for phalanx fractures. 400 of them had a fracture. Um, and after the AP and lateral view, so they took all three views. They just blinded the radiologist to the oblique view. Um, after the AP and lateral, fracture was diagnosed in 400, not diagnosed in 1,000, and about a 30 of them, a fairly small proportion of them, just a couple of percent, the radiologist said it was equivocal. I can't tell. There's something there. It could be a nutrient vessel, et cetera. Um, and so then they unblinded them to the oblique view and saw how often that changed the impression. And it did change the impression with a fair frequency. It was about uh, just slightly under 5% of the time. Now, the majority of what it did is it converted the equivocals to a non-equivocal. So they said, oh, okay, no, there's definitely not a fracture or there definitely is a fracture. So it didn't affect um, an overall a change in diagnosis very frequently, but about 2% it did go from negative to positive. Now, we don't have a gold standard, and the, ra the, the British hand surgeons will then say, yeah, those radio you're over-treating those. Those weren't fractures, etc. But that's what they observed is that by the addition of the oblique view, they picked up about 2% of the time a fracture that was invisible or they didn't see at all or even have a suspicion of. They didn't call it equivocal um, on the AP and lateral view. So, you know, again, for, your, for most of us, this is relatively immaterial. This has probably been settled at your institution long ago. But if you are doing two views, I would, I would just recommend that if you have a high clinical suspicion and the x-ray doesn't show it, perhaps adding another view might be of some value. If, you don't, if you're not particularly concerned, um, I think it's, it's reasonable to do whatever your institutional protocol is, the usual institutional protocol. Abstract 4 says, well, if the addition of one view is good, I mean, you know what the addition of two views is going to be. So, so now we've got to x-ray people four times. So this is a really sort of, it's a strange paper. It's really hard to make much of the numbers. It's um, a study of 12 people who got an 
the, in addition to the external view, oblique view, which is the usual, they flipped the hand inside and did a fourth view. And they found that in these cases, they were able to identify uh, otherwise occult fracture. Now, you know, there's no numerators and denominators in terms of how many people were evaluated this way. It's a really sort of, it's almost just sort of a case report kind of study. But it does highlight again this point that if, you know, if the kid's finger is really swollen or the person's finger is really swollen, you, you know, they heard a snap and you're really worried about it um, and you get your standard three views, don't see anything, if, if you feel that this is going to change your management, it may be reasonable to ask for an extra view. I wouldn't do it routinely by any stretch of the imaginations, but this is just something that suggests that even after three negatives, th the fracture can be observed on this other oblique view, so the internal oblique view. Again, don't do this routinely, but if you need to on occasion, I think it's, a, it's, it's something you maybe ought to know about. All right, so those are fingers. That's all I'm gonna say about finger fractures for now. Now I'm going to move to the meaty fracture of the wrist, which is the meaty fracture of the wrist that we don't want to deal, we, we don't want to deal with ever. Scaphoid fractures, yes. We have several, several articles here. And the first one um, that I'm going to talk about is, is number five. This is the one that's supposed to scare us. So, you know, the deal with scaphoid fractures is that when you fall down and hit your wrist, you're, it always hurts here. Right? I mean, you know, when does it not hurt there? No, I fell down and hurt my wrist, Doc. I came in just to get checked out. No, it hurts all over the place, and it hurts here, and it hurts here, and it hurts there. So it always hurts, and we know two things about scaphoid fractures. One is that sometimes they're radio, uh, they're radio loose, and you can't see them, right? You just can't see them on the x-ray. That's one thing we know, and we know another thing about it, which is what? Right, they don't heal good sometimes, right? They're, they're problematic, and for two reasons. One is you get um, non-union, which is actually the more common problem, and then the other one is avascular necrosis. It has this awkward blood supply that we always talk about, and I have no idea why we really talk about it. It's not that important. What's important is that it doesn't heal correctly. Um, so it's just a fracture like that. One of the issues that arises right off the bat is, okay, is it the ones that, were, that, are radi that are invisible radiographically that actually lead to these dreaded complications? Or is it the ones where someone falls down and their scaphoid is, looks like dust particles on x-ray and you're like, oh yeah, that's the one that's not gonna heal well. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. But the question, the, it's a fairly relevant question. If in fact you can have these occult scaphoid fractures and still have the bad outcome, that's a problem for us if in fact the ones that go on to have bad outcomes are the ones that are co completely obvious to begin with, then we can relax a little bit about this fracture and not worry that they're gonna get non-union and then wrist instability and chronic functional limitation. Abstract 5, sort of in a roundabout way, gets to this question. It's delays and poor management of scaphoid fractures contributing to non-union. Um, and this is uh, from, you know, it's a recent study, University of Toronto, 2011. So this is a, a person, this is a hand surgeon who has referred a bunch of cases of non-union of scaphoid fractures. So these are just the ones that, you know, didn't, that, that developed problems, okay? But what was interesting about it is uh, that 40% of the people who had these non-union of scaphoid fractures had no recollection of a traumatic event. There's, I don't know, you know whatever. Maybe they were super drunk. I don't know. That would, again, I'm reflecting the county experience onto the, all these people. But I don't think so. Most of them didn't. Um, of those that did, the large majority went on to see either their doctor or fre very frequently an emergency department and got an x-ray. Something like 90% of them or 85% of them got an x-ray. The other 15% didn't, um, which the, you know, this guy is, of course, very critical, but who knows what they were complaining of when they went into the emergency room. You know, I mean, the 40% couldn't remember anything. The, 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 some of those, I'm sure, were complaining of finger pain or elbow pain or something like that. So some of them didn't get an x-ray, but here's the really relevant piece of it. Of those that showed up and got an x-ray, they had an acute presentation, got an x-ray, 10% um, of them, actually a little bit more, about 15% of them had a negative x-ray. Okay, so these are people that have non-union, right? They had a discrete event. They went and got an x-ray. He reviewed the x-ray from the, you know, the big chair it, with retrospective knowledge of the disaster that has occurred and said, yeah, it wasn't there. So this clinical entity, I mean, for, so the rest of this paper I don't really find particularly interesting. Um, most of the cases, just FYI, 
didn't, weren't associated with any mismanagement, by, at least by a physician. Sometimes they criti he criticized the patients for not going and getting you know, their, their wrist checked or taking off the splint too early, et cetera. But most of the cases were not associated with, even from retrospect, mismanagement of the doctor. So it may be that it doesn't, you can't do anything to prevent this non-union, but this clinical entity of someone falling down, coming into the ED, getting an x-ray, nothing there, and then going on to have a bad outcome downstream exists. That's what this paper proves to me, at least. Uh, yes, sir. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, why would you? You know, <laughs> why, why? It's it. You know, I actually, I actually remember a case that I saw. Um, you know, it was a couple of years ago, and more than that, probably like five years ago now. It was a young woman who came in with wrist pain, and she had a big hole in her scaphoid. And I'm like, this is non-union of scaphoid fracture. What, what happened? You know, it was obviously old and, you know, was very non-union. The, the hole in her bone was well corrugated. Um, and she had no recollection of it either. You know, I think that we just don't see those cases because they're presenting with chronic wrist pain and, and, and things like that. They're not going to come into the emergency department. This was at the, the Olive View County Hospital, so she was coming in because my wrist is hurt for months and months. I think in general, we just won't see those cases. Um, but it does appear to exist, and it should be, it's cause for some alarm and for us to think, okay, what can we do to make sure we diagnose this? Okay. Um, and again, we don't know how, how frequent it is. We just know that it happens. All right, so the question is then, now that we've established this exists, how are we going to handle the patients who are x-ray negative? And the abstract six, a whole bunch of these abstracts are going to talk about varying strategies to deal with this. Abstract six just highlights the problem. It's about radiography for acute scaphoid fractures. It's the concept that when someone has pain in their snuff box, you immobilize them, and you say, get an x-ray in a couple of weeks, you know, and then we'll look and see if there's callus formation or, you know, some other you know, magical stuff. And, um, and then we'll be able to decide if you have a scaphoid fracture, and if you don't, we'll take off the splint and you can go about your business. So what they did here, they took 50 patients with normal x-rays at presentation, each of whom got an MRI after a couple of weeks. The MRI was considered the gold standard. It identified um, fracture in 35 patients. So this isn't the normal population. These must have been people that had, you know, pretty bad wrist injuries, et cetera, because a huge proportion of them went on to have, you know, have fractures, which is unusual. Um, to have that many. And what they did then is they took follow-up x-rays and they said, okay, radiologists, emergency physicians, everybody, here's the two sets of x-rays. Figure out if the person has a fracture or not, right? So they had the x-rays a couple weeks later, the initial x-rays, and they sat there and they looked in their light boxes and, every, and they were wrong all the time, right? They, they very infrequently picked up the fracture. The best radiologist picked up fif less than 50% of the fractures. The worst person picked up 9% of the fractures, right? So they picked up three out of the 35. So, you know, this is just something suggesting that maybe that strategy is not the most brilliant um, strategy of all time to just, you know, do the x-ray a couple of weeks later. It's a little skewed data. It's hard to understand, but certainly it does call into question the utility of that practice. And now the next ones say, well, you know, if those x-rays don't work so good, how about that MRI seemed to be a pretty good strategy? So number seven is role of MRI in the diagnosis of clinically suspected scaphoid fracture. This is in that British Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, and it's a British study of seven, uh, 600 and some odd patients um, with ec who were x-ray negative after a FUSH but still had snuff box tenderness. They got an MRI about two weeks after the injury, after the plane film. Um, and they, they found some very interesting findings. They found that about 50% of the people, so these, this is a consecutive, this is all the people who show up in the ED, 50% of them had an injury to their wrist, okay? Um, of course, most of those weren't scaphoid fractures. Most of them were bone bruises. So 50% had nothing, 50% had an injury, but 50% of those injuries, so 25% of the total, were just bone bruises. And the reason this is relevant is because they're still tender after a couple of days or a week or something. So you pull off that, that splint, and you go, hey, how's your wrist? And they still hurt, right? There's just nothing that needs to be immobilized, right? So th these, these authors say, and then the rest were largely scaphoid fractures, and there were a host of other small things like uh, distal radius fractures that aren't very significant, et cetera. But the, about 10 to 12%, depending on what you believe in this particular paper, of the, uh, of the people who were x-ray negative but had the MRI, 10 to 12% of those people had an occult scaphoid fracture proven on MRI, okay? So th it exists, 
50% of them are going to have a bone bruise. So if you take this strategy of wait and see, touch on the wrist and see how it's going, you're going to end up keeping those people, which is the majority, in a splint for a long time while their bone bruise heals. If any of you have ever had a bone bruise, it takes as long to heal or stop hurting as a scapoid fracture does. So um, they argue that you'll get better functional outcomes by doing an MRI earlier because you can take the splint off and then say, go you know, get your wrist therapy or go about your daily business and you don't have to walk around with this goofy thing on your, on your arm. You know, this is all systems-based. If you're in a county facility like us, we do the MRI at six years, not at six, six days. Um, you know, the rest of you, it, you know, it depends on your, the, the patient, the insurance mix, the, the ability for them to see someone in follow-up, et cetera. But this is a, a reasonable strategy to consider, at least, in, in, a, in a, a resourced patient and in a resourced system. Um, the next one is, is a similar kind of concept. It's cost effectiveness of MRI managing scaphoid. It's the same idea. They took a, a bunch of people um, and got them an early MRI and then you know, did another group um, and gave them a late, a late MRI with, uh, no, I'm sorry, no MRI. They just kept them in the splint for four to six weeks. And then they claimed at the end that it was more cost effective to do the MRI early because the people were able to return to work a little bit earlier. Um, again, you know, they, it's a little bit unrealistic. They cite the cost of an MRI at really low. It's because I believe this was a, a Danish study, uh, not an American study. But nonetheless, the point was the same as the last one, that you can get them out of the splint quicker if you get the diagnosis right away. I do not think we should order MRIs for snuff box tenderness um, in the emergency department. Okay, I don't think that that is a wise strategy. Only 10% of those people end up having a scaphoid fracture. I think what this data so says to me is that you can do a combo of watch and wait and early MRI, and that's probably the best thing to do, and we should probably, if you're working in urgent cares or workers' comp places, or if you have access to primary care physicians and can influence them, I would suggest that that's where we focus our efforts. Say, you fell, you hurt your wrist, I'm gonna put a splint on it. In a few days, take it off. If it's still painful, then early MRI is the right way to go. If it's not painful after a week or five days or something like that, if you can range it well, I think that that's the po at the point where I would suggest that we just say, that's great, it was just a boo-boo, all right? So that's all I'm gonna say about scaphoid fractures. Oh no, I'm sorry, there's one last thing I'm gonna say, abstract number 10, it's kind of interesting, I don't know what to make of it. It's fracture of, of the carpal navicular, so scaphoid, um, and it's the value of adding two more x-rays. So the standard, scaphoid, uh, the standard wrist film with scaphoid views is four views of the, of the wrist. This adds two more. They're hyperpronation views and hypersupination views. Yeah, you gotta really stretch over like that. It's kind of an interesting study, and it, it, the idea here is Okay, um, you know, your patient's never going to get an MRI. It's not going to happen. It's a, you know, poor p person, with, you know, with no, no insurance, et cetera. You can try this strategy, but it's not going to work. Or you can put them in a splint, but they're a day laborer, and, uh, you know, you've just committed them to, like, financial ruin because they're not going to be able to work for four to six weeks. So is there anything else you can do to shed light on this situation? This is a study of, um, I believe, about 90, yeah, 90 patients, Huge number of them had scaphoid fractures. Allegedly, this is a consecutive sample, but that seems impossible. Of the 90, 54 had scaphoid fractures seen on the, the standard views. So huge proportion, over 50%. Um, and then what they found, though, is by the addition of the extra views, they picked up 11 more fractures. So a huge number of, so that's not terribly surprising. At 17% of the fractures were therefore missed, which is more or less consistent with what we're saying previously, um, that you pick up, the, you know, there's this 10%-ish sort of thing going on, although it's in the opposite direction here. Um, so they say that adding these extra views gives you that. And moreover, they followed up all of the people, allegedly followed up all the people who didn't have a fracture identified on you know, any of the views, the four or the six views. At four to six weeks, they re-x-rayed them all and none of them had a fracture or evidence of bone healing or anything like that. So they claim that this is 100% sensitive um, and 100% specific way of approaching this. 
Now, that would be wonderful, and I have no evidence to refute that because the study hasn't been replicated. I mean, it's a 22-year-old study at this, 23-year-old study at this point, hasn't been replicated. Um, so I don't know, it's really intriguing. Can you do this, uh, these extra views and pick up stuff? My suspicion is it's, it's not really true, that if it was replicated, the data wouldn't look so good. However, if you're in that situation where you have those, you know, those types of patients that you're, you, you really don't want to put them in a splint, you don't think it's particularly wise, it's going to cause them a lot of functional and financial tr hardship to do that, um, I think, you know, maybe this is a viable strategy. It's, it, you know, it's, it's not great. I would still recommend outpatient MRI kind of situation, follow up with outpatient MRI. But, um, you know, if you're trying to help your patient out, this may be a strategy that can help you. Get those extra two views if you're still, still um, suspicious. All right. Boy, I only have a couple minutes because... This guy, Mr. Talks a lot to aid into my time here. That's okay. Um, let's see. Mr. Talks a lot. The last, I'm going to skip a couple of the abstracts that talk about how to most effectively splint a scaphoid fracture. Um, they're kind of funny studies if you're, for your reading. They're about cadavers and, and, you know, the best way to splint a cadaver if you artificially break their scaphoid. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in that or had an intention to do that, go ahead and knock yourself out. Um, read those so that you, your cadaver can heal. Um, but the, the couple of things I'm going to talk about just over the next couple of minutes are abstracts 19, 20, and 21. And this is the, you know, drunk early 20s year old man punching a wall because he's mad at his girlfriend fracture, the boxer's fracture, probably, you know, one of the top fractures seen in the emergency department. Obviously, it's a, you know, a meta metacarpal fracture of the fifth or sometimes the fourth metacarpal, with, usually with angulation. And these are strategies of dealing with this. In our institution, uh, typically, our, radi our um, orthopedists, hand people, and residents like to push on these and manipulate them and try to get them in this 90-90 thing and put them in this um, ulnar gutter type splint and all of those kinds of things. It's super fun. You move the fracture all over the place. You put the splint in. You get another x-ray, and it looks exactly like it did when you started, right? I mean, as a, you know, and then you do it again, and then after, after the third time of it looking exactly the same, you say, well, you know, it looks better. You know, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Mercy. You cry uncle and leave. So this, this article is really these couple of articles are really interesting. Um, the first one is just a, a case series where they say, forget this stuff. Just put them in a volar plate and move on. You know, just a simple volar splint and move on. They claim that the functional outcomes are excellent, equal to historical controls when they really manipulated them, etc. And the next two are, are cool studies because the first one is called um, functional taping of it. So this is an RCT. It's in, uh, out of Holland. It's a Dutch study where they, put, they buddy taped it. You got a boxer's fracture. The only caveat is that these were not rotated, so your finger wasn't pointing this way or that way. If they were rotated, they reduced them. They put them on a, a, a buddy tape and a piece of tape around the wrist, and they said, have at it. Okay, and the functional outcomes were the same at every time point. Actually, they were a little better earlier, right, because the person, people could move their hands. So this strategy was effective for managing boxer's fractures. The next, absolutely effective. The next abstract down says, well, if doing nothing or doing next to nothing is good, then doing nothing must be great. It's a randomized control trial of ace wrapping them versus just put a little ace wrap on them versus, um, you know, the usual splinting and the functional outcomes were identical across the board. So it appears that whatever you do, as long as it's not uh, rotated, in which case it needs to be reduced and maybe pinned, um, any strategy is perfectly fine. Now, that might not fly in your institution, but at least from a scientific perspective, that appears to be true. Yes, sir? Up to 70 degrees, they did. That was in these two studies. No. No. I mean, I've always learned more than 60, you're supposed to do something. But again, you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you keep x-raying, and it looks more or less the same at the end of the day. So. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> you, should, you should write your case series up. <laughs> What's that? What do you mean, make a fist? <laughs> Oh, yeah, oh, to check for rotation. Yeah, so check for rotation. You just have them make a, a fist and make sure that their finger doesn't splay, their pinky finger doesn't splay out this way or too much inside. Uh, you know, always remember that when you make a fist, your pinky finger will sort of tuck under a little bit in most people for a while, and then it'll straighten out when you make the complete fist. Uh, most people who have a boxer's fracture can't make the complete fist. They get stuck here. So you often have the pinky finger just a little bit under the fourth digit. Compare that with the other side and just to make sure there's no rotational deformity. It's very uncommon to have rotational deformity, actually, in, in boxer's fractures. 